Let's start out with, uh, with Nolan. Um, how did you arrive at this formula of easy to learn and difficult to master? Well, remember, Atari started out in the coin-operated game business. And so we were sort of balanced between how do you make a game that is satisfying immediately upon dropping a quarter in. But at the same time, you had to get the person to fail in three minutes so that you could get the next quarter. More money. <laughs> and, and so we decided that we had to make it challenging enough that they wanted to come back and get better and better and better. You know, when you were starting out, you were not just starting your own company as a young man, but you were essentially, it was a birth of a, of a medium. Nobody thought that games were a business. And so we, we always had no capital. The other part was the technology was really lousy. Pong had a square ball, not because we thought the square balls were cool. Um, <laughs> It was because that's about as good as we could do. <laughs> and, uh, and so we were constantly fighting what we wanted to do with what the technology would let us mm -hmm. do. Dong, what, what for you are the essentials of effective game design? At first, I want to make something that people can play anytime, anywhere. I want to make something that people can easy, easily to remember. Like uh, I have a background of city in mm -hmm. the game and have a blue sky that every of Nintendo games has. What, what was the appeal of the, that generation of games for you? The retro game is a more focused. I don't have to really learn how to play. Mm -hmm. I can learn by my own mistake. So you're talking about kind of a, you know, really a frictionless kind of entry to playing the game, which I think was what we all remember about the, those titles growing up. How did that influence kind of the design of, of Flappy Bird? Instead of adding more content in, in the game, I should focus more time, I should spend more time on tuning the gameplay to make it right. Let, let's talk what was until recently one of the great urban legends in gaming was that Atari had made so many uh, ET cartridges that they were buried in a desert in New Mexico, Nolan, if you knew those were there well, in the desert and you just didn't tell First of all, <laughs> I had left three years before, so not on my watch. Right. Guys that were running Atari after me didn't play games. They were suits. They don't understand how critical the, the man-machine interface is with the gameplay. And in those days, a good cartridge took at least six months to design. They thought that an ET game would be cool, so they did a, a, a licensing deal in late August, but the, the cartridge had to start shipping in middle October, in six weeks. To do a full cartridge game, it was impossible. I actually got an early copy. It was unplayable. And so all of a sudden they had this tsunami mm -hmm. of returned cartridges. And so the best thing to do was to bury them in the desert and then pour concrete over them. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of games do you see coming uh, out on these, these new forms of hardware? I think um, VR has always been this promise of the holodeck for the Trekkies who are out there. And and that you're there. And uh, I can tell you that the technology is sufficient now that you can actually be in VR and not throw up. Um, <laughs> motion sickness was always a big problem. Yeah. I mean, VR has been around on some levels for 20 years. But the motion sickness issue is you, you have a hard time making a business when you make people sick. <laughs> I, I, you know. Uh, all the game that I think is adult game, adult game. Adult game. Yeah. But when you say that, what do you mean? Because here, because I I, adult game has a different yeah. connotation. <laughs> <laughs> because I was in Tokyo before this trip to right. New York, and Maybe that I is see a lot of adult game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, we're out of time, but thank you. Thank you.